Hi, Jen. everyone. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Um, so we see um, we have a Padlet built out for uh, this session that's going to have all of our resources uh, that you'll be able to refer back to. And we also have a Google folder of resources uh, for everyone to use uh, through the session and after. So welcome officially to Culturally Responsive Teaching and Social Emotional Learning for SLIFE. Um, we're excited for you all to be here. And thank you for taking uh, a few hours after of your afternoon out to share with us this afternoon. I'd like to introduce myself if you don't know me yet. I'm Diane Sterfenner and I am the president of Support Ed. And I'm Shannon Smith. I'm one of the multilingual learner coaches with Support Ed. Uh, before we get uh, started, I wanted to share a little Zoom tip. Uh, we're going to be using our chat a lot today, so feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Any messages that are coming from the Support Ed team will start and end with three asterisks. And just some virtual session norms. Uh, we're going to have a lot of opportunities for participation. Uh, one way is when asked to share through audio and video with the whole group, share through audio and video in breakout rooms, and also uh, engage in the chat. Uh, we will also have some independent work time. Uh, and But at that time, you can turn off your video while working independently and then turn it back on when it's ready to return to the group. So we have three main objectives for the session today. One is to define SLIFE and their characteristics, explore strategies and tools for creating a culturally responsive school climate that includes social emotional practices for SLIFE and to apply tools and strategies to your class and school communities. On our slides, we like to have some session icons so that you know where to find some of our resources and what activities we're doing. Uh, when you see the Google folder, that's where you can find some materials uh, in the Google Drive. Uh, you, we also have items on our Padlet and you'll see that icon when we have videos, the video icon will show, discussion activities, uh, like I said, we'll have some breakout groups, so be sure to, uh, you'll see those with the little breakout rooms, and finally, you'll see the poll icon for our polls. So as we saw earlier, uh, when you entered, uh, we do have a session Padlet, and you can access it with a bit.ly, and I think the, Diane Choi is going to be dropping it into our chat here shortly. Um, and let me show you what it'll look like. When you go, you'll see uh, the materials for this first session here, including the presentation slides and the Google folder of resources and other additional resources that are aligned to this session. Um, we are gonna be offering additional sessions throughout the fall, and we're gonna keep the same Padlet uh, so that you can grow some resources along the way. Um, this is the first of four sessions uh, that we're offering as part of professional development around SLIFE. Um, the next sessions, session two, three, and four, uh, are going to be around effective instruction of SLIFE, supporting SLIFE and community engagement, and supporting graduation and post-secondary success of SLIFE. And Google Drive, there is a document that has all of these sessions and links so that you can register for those if you haven't already done so. So we have a lot of information uh, to share with you this, this afternoon. Um, so our agenda is in document two um, that you can get a more detailed agenda and also some links uh, to the resources that we'll be sharing. Um, I'm going to start off with this introduction and overview. Uh, 
followed by a definition and characteristics of SLIFE, exploring strategies and tools for creating a culturally responsive school climate, applying tools and strategies to create welcoming schools uh, and classrooms, and then some next steps before you leave today. So in a, just in the chat very briefly, share what you're looking forward to in this session. I see Heather is looking forward to some strategies and tools. Which is exciting because that's what we're going to share with you today. But first we want to give a, a little bit of our definition and some characteristics of SLIFE. So one of the pieces that uh, we usually like to start is what do we already know and what data do we already have? Um, the Maine Department of Education has developed a multilingual learner dashboard of data on topics such as enrollment, assessment, language, and graduation. We're going to share some of the pieces um, from that dashboard as it relates to SLIFE. However, you can take a deeper dive by accessing the link on our Padlet. Two items of note in terms of uh, enrollment is that 3.2% of the student population in Maine are multilingual learners. And when we look from last year to this year, there was a 5.17% uh, increase in the uh, multilingual learners enrolling in the state of Maine. When you look at the languages, uh, the top 10 languages in Maine, uh, Portuguese, Langala, Passamaquoddy, and Kinyarwanda uh, increased the most in the last year. Um, when you look at Portuguese, Portuguese is a uh, commonly spoken uh, language by families from Angola, and Lingala and Kinyarwanda uh, are languages commonly spoken by families coming from the Democratic Republic of Congo, or the DRC. So one piece that I think is that we notice is missing, there isn't data that's specifically on SLIFE yet on that dashboard, but we can kind of get an idea of where families and students are coming from. So let's shift and start thinking about how we consider or how do we define SLIFE and what are some of their characteristics. So in the chat, uh, share what you believe is the, the definition or how you would define SLIFE and some of their key characteristics. And I see some really good themes in there. That interrupted education. And I'm seeing some assets. So there is no federal definition uh, for students with limited or interrupted formal education. However, there is a lot of, uh, a few states that, that have developed their own definitions, but they vary state by state. And Maine is in the process of developing a formal definition of their own to help, you know, 
look at students within the state of Maine and define those SLIFE students. But here are some common elements that we see across the states. SLIFE are those MLs who have a language other than English spoken at the home. They enter the US after grade two. They have at least two years less schooling and are at least two years below grade level. So they have gaps in their education. So what strengths do SLIFE bring? So thinking about the strengths that, that the students can bring to your school, your classroom, share in the chat something that is a strength that, the SLI, that SLIFE learners can bring to school. There are a lot of great ideas coming out in, in the chat in terms of culture, being bilingual, motivation. So some of the items that you mentioned we also have here is that some strengths uh, for our SLIFE learners. Resiliency their ability to problem solve, their cultural pride. They have strong family ties, motivation, and sense of community. In addition, they have funds of knowledge or those skills and knowledge that, that have been historically and culturally developed to enable them to function within their own culture. And that can be really helpful to leverage within your students once you know a little bit more about what funds of knowledge that they bring to your classroom. So let's take a closer look at some of the general characteristics of SLIFE as they arrive in the U.S. Because SLIFE students have gaps in their academic content knowledge, they're often over age for the grade level placement. Um, for example, a SLIFE may be placed in ninth grade because of lack of school credits, but may be 18 years or older. Um, so it's really important to consider um, making sure that they're getting the essential content they need academically, but also that they're giving. I think Shannon's uh, oh. internet may have just frozen. Oh, are you back with us, Shannon? Sorry, where did I leave off? Um, let's, I think right maybe the middle of the first bullet. Okay. Over age, you talked about a, uh, a ninth grader, maybe being about 18 years old. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I think the winds are coming through Pennsylvania right now. Um, but yes, yeah, so a ninth grader may be uh, placed, a, a, a slife may be placed in ninth grade because of high school credits, uh, maybe not having uh, the academic credits, but uh, we have to make sure that we're taking in consideration that they have academic needs, but may also need to have sufficient times to interact with their peers their own age. There may be limited or no literacy in their home language um, due to education. Uh, So it's important to make to consider expectations that you may have for students to be able to read and write or just making sure they're not placed in situations that might embarrass them. For example, having to read or write in front of other students. Often, SLIFE have needs that are distinct from other um, multilingual learners who have not experienced a gap in their education. Uh, these can include social emotional needs, such as symptoms of stress, isolation, or just frustration in their new setting. And SLIFE faced that potential double challenge of mastering academic and skills while they're mastering linguistic skills. All of these challenges make our SLIFE a higher risk for dropping out of school.
So we also have the, uh, we talked a little bit about the possible social emotional needs. Um, these could be repercussions from poverty and inadequate health care. It could be coming from the stress, frustration, or depression due to situations they've endured prior to coming to the United States. It could be due to post-traumatic stress disorder after suffering traumas, challenges associated with family separation or reunification um, after long periods of time of being apart. Knowing more about a student's living situation can definitely help in providing the appropriate supports. Uh, fear of the, about their current or perceived immigration status. While we don't ask those things, uh, the immigration status uh, of students, uh, it, it can be a factor in their social emotional health. And then the changing family roles. Um, as SLIFE are coming and uh, moving to a new environment and they may be expected to contribute to the family in new and different ways. So just to add on some of the situations and conditions that contribute to SLIFE, it could be a, a lack of access to schools because of living in places like rural settings or refugee camps where schools might not be nearby or accessible. The education system may be very different than what we have in the United States. For example, secondary education might vary uh, from the expectations that we have here and could end at the ninth grade. There could be violence or civil unrest. Students may not have an opportunity to attend school because they're female and education isn't offered in equitable ways uh, across genders in other countries. Again, we noted poverty. Uh, families may not be able to afford to send their children to school or afford to send them after a certain age. And finally, mobility. Uh, families may be moving uh, back and forth between their home country and the United States, or they may just be moving within the United States, which causes disruptions in, in education. So I've done a lot of talking. Now it's your turn to do some talking. Um, we're going to break out and discuss some of the pieces that I've shared with you um, about the state demographics and just the general SLIFE characteristics. Uh, we have some questions here on the right that you can reflect and share with in your breakout groups. And I'm just gonna go here. Um, we do have this on a Google Doc so that you Google Slides so that you can uh, share together. Uh, you'll have 10 minutes in your breakout room to find the slide for your group, select a person to be a reporter and one to be a recorder. Uh, the recorder can share their screen so everybody can see what the discussion is and your slides will look just like this um, where you can write down your group discussion and create that one statement that you're gonna share when you come back. Yeah, so Shannon, can you tell us how you know what group, what, what oh. number slide to locate? <laughs> when you get sent to your breakout group, you will have your, um, each group, each breakout group will have a number. You can always find that at the top left hand of your screen as well. And then you find the number slide that corresponds to your group and you'll fill that in. So you'll fill in some notes on the group discussion, but really, like Shannon said, pulling together that one statement that you're prepared to share at the bottom will be important as well. And we're going to be popping in and out of the room. So if you have any, if you need any help, let us know. Send us a message in the chat. Great. So we're going into breakout groups. Are there any questions before we move into the groups? Okay, you'll see your, your questions are differentiated by your roles, so. And if you don't have, if your role isn't there, the most important part is to have the conversation um, around those demographics and the SLIFE characteristics.
Thank you, Eva. On the road. Yeah, please don't, <laughs> please don't respond. You can listen in for sure. Thank you. Yeah, I think we can go ahead and open up the groups. So we're just going to call on us. Well, there's only three groups. Uh, so I think we can uh, give an opportunity for each group to share today. Um, how about we start with group one? Um, and it's okay if you didn't come up with your formal statement. We'll just know better for next time, uh, time management. But uh, I know every group is always uh, so excited to share that sometimes we run out of time. So who is the reporter for group one? We, we didn't determine a reporter. Jane, you have the notes. Are you able to synthesize them all? I like that move, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> we spend our time building relationships. That's great. I love that. Um, sure. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, I have it in front of me. And it was just really nice. A lot of um, different roles. We had teacher roles, counselor, and administrator. Um, present and just really talking about the complexity and the diversity uh, just within our small group of our lived experiences with um, SLIFE programming. And, um, and just uh, we, one thing that really spoke was um, SACO um, and that's a neighboring district to, to us here in Portland and just, you know, how um, just a very, very large, large increase in, in students. I think it was over 300% increase. Um, and so just, you know, that, that kind of like, how do we support each other and using the state definition to really guide us and to um, kind of have something to work from um, was a little bit of the common thread, I guess. Thank you. Um, I think that I don't even remember what group I was in. See, I'm, I'm just as, as bad at, at paying attention to that as well. Um, and let's see, group, how about group two shares next? I think we might have been group two, but if, I, if that's not true, someone jumped in here. Um, so we had a, a great conversation. Um, we talked a lot about um, how many of us come from schools where um, SLIFE, awareness of SLIFE is very low among the staff as a whole, um, and how it's very challenging um, for classroom teachers to be in a position where they're asked to incorporate students and engage students who, who possibly don't understand what's happening and possibly don't have literacy skills in their first or primary language to integrate into the classroom. And that is a new, that's a new demand that many teachers are feeling. Um, and also, I think we talked quite a bit about the fact that um, ESOL staff is, uh, I, I don't wanna use the word overwhelmed because that was not said, but not enough time is there to meet the need um, for the ESOL staff to actually work with the classroom teachers and the students themselves. Thank you. Thanks. And I think that that leads to my group, group three. Um, and uh, I think a lot of the statements, uh, we spend a lot of time getting to know each other in our roles and some perspectives as well. So. Um, uh, group three, whoever the reporter has been chosen to be. We didn't designate a reporter either, um, but I'm happy to jump in and share a little bit. We talked about demographics, how we have the about a 3% multilingual learner population as compared to the overall student population. But in a given district, it can be upwards of 50% in a school um, so it's, it's a very different picture from district to district across the state. And we don't have any data behind, um, we have no data to tell us how many students are SLIFE. We just have anecdotal understanding, which is uh, something we're trying to work on now with developing our definition. Um, and we spent a little bit of time talking about how um, it is a, 
large impact on the school district to have students who are SLIFE, especially schools that might not be very experienced in serving multilingual learners in general. And then the needs of SLIFE are, are um, also different from those of a multilingual learner who is not SLIFE. Um, so there are schools in Maine that are comfortable with that and have a lot of experience under their belts and schools that are really new to that. And I think the, the last thing that was said was a really nice way to wrap things up, which was how important it is for us to approach programming first life from an asset based perspective and understanding all the incredible funds of knowledge that they bring with them and making sure that the programming they receive is very rigorous. Thank you. Um, so at this point, we are going to start exploring some of those strategies and tools for creating a culturally responsive school climate for SLICE. Great. Thank you, Shannon. And I will continue with this piece, although now I'm not able to advance your slides from my screen. We, we learned this new trick, but now the trick is not working for me. So you can just go ahead and if we can't figure it out, just feel free to advance them. Oh, now I can look at that. So this is our next piece in our little puzzle to talk a little bit about how does culturally responsive teaching fit in. And so we will begin by focusing on how we define culture. And maybe in the chat, we can start by just sharing a couple of words or a phrase. How would you define culture? There are lots of definitions, right? Unspoken conventions. I like that. Thanks, April. Now I could trust you to get the ball rolling. <laughs> Everything. Yeah. Okay, maybe one more definition. Okay. Thanks, Laura. Visible and invisible characteristics, community norms, and sense of identity and belonging. Great. Thank you. So, why do you think? Why is this important to talk about students' cultures in the work you do with SLIFE? And we have such a small group, you feel free to unmute and just share as well if you'd rather talk instead of type. So what, what's the connection? Especially if you're maybe talking with someone that doesn't have as deep of an understanding of culture and slide. So if you are um, working with students who come from a culture that is um, a collectivist culture uh, and our uh, Western education system is really designed um, on an individual model, uh, it's helpful to know that and uh, bring in uh, more opportunities for students to work collectively, to work um, in groups and partner and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely, Robin. And we're going to talk a, about that a little bit uh, here in the future as well. Whoops, this is a little, there we go. So here's, you all shared definitions of culture. Here's one that we look at. Um, and this also, this comes from our book, Culturally Responsive Teaching, that I co-authored with um, my longtime collaborator, Sydney Snyder. And so a lot of um, this is in, in our book and we're sharing a lot of resources on our Padlet as well. So you can see this one definition on these unspoken, right? Unspoken rules that uh, was mentioned, that were mentioned. And so looking a little bit deeper, we know and you're all in, in the field, right? So we know that culture is complex. It's changing all of the time. We are all members of different cultural groups and we can be moving in and out of groups. Jane, I'm glad you like the Padlet. Yeah, take it and use it, share it. That's why we created it, so thanks. Um, and within groups, there's a great variability as well. Um, yeah, if we think of, um, for example, like if you, one of the districts that was in our, 
uh, breakout room, they have they have a lot of Spanish speakers, but within that group of Spanish speakers, there's going to be so much variability as well. So we know we have three different levels of culture on the surface level. We know our iceberg level. Um, well, these are things that we expect. So there's a low emotional impact if there's a difference. Like we expect um, speakers to have, or SLIFE or multilingual learners to speak different languages, have different food and clothing. But under the surface, it can begin under the shallow level, can have a higher emotional impact. Some examples are the concepts of time or nonverbal communication. These might not be expected and some it can cause a little upset for some that aren't expecting it. But the deepest level of culture can cause a more intense emotional impact. Some examples are uh, people's concepts of fairness and justice on gender roles, for example. So why does culture matter in teaching and learning, right? We see impact on students. Um, that you can see here and comparing them to impacts also on teachers. So ways of communicating, it goes both ways. Students' classroom behavior, but our expectations for students are really dependent on our own culture and what, what we expect. And the roles of, you know, our students have a very different understanding of the role of the teacher and teachers might have a different understanding of classroom management. When I was a high school ESOL teacher um, in Fairfax County, Virginia, I spent most of my career in the US in Fairfax County before I started support ed. So in Fairfax, we're uh, about the 10th or 11th largest district in the US. And I remember teaching high school ESL or ESOL, um, my students would stand up when I came into the room. And so that was that was their concept of the role of the teacher. The teacher was right. You don't, um, you know, you you don't challenge that at all. And parents were the same way. You kind of believed the teacher. The teacher um, had a lot of respect. And so um, we also know in our work in culturally responsive teaching, we draw a lot from Zaretta Hammond's work, uh, if you're familiar with her. Um, so what does cultural responsiveness have to do with the brain? So we know that our, our brains really seek to minimize any kinds of social threats. And our students, especially our SLIFE students, right, they may have lived through trauma. They've definitely lived through a lot of experiences we might not be aware of. And that forming positive relationships with their, at least one teacher, hopefully more, helps them feel less threatened and helps the, you know, their parts of the brain kind of feel less anxiety. Um, and culture is really guides how we process so many kinds of information. Um, and that we know, we talked about funds of knowledge that we our students can hang new information on their existing funds of knowledge, but it's up to us as teachers to find out what those funds of knowledge are, are and to share those with other educators. And so um, we also know that there is, um, when SLIFE enters schools, they can feel cultural dissonance. So disoriented, alienated, isolated. And this idea, this can kind of show up in the ways that you see here about SLIFE um, these, in these few areas that we describe here. So for a lot of SLIFE, nothing or maybe little of what they experience tends to be honored and respected in their new environment. So they're often seen as lesser, right? Lesser than. So they, they're seen as less capable than their peers and either even other multilingual learners who might not understand and know how school and learning tasks function. So that's definitely something to keep in mind with our students. And so, uh, Robin, I believe you mentioned individualist and collectivist cultures. Absolutely. So, you know, we want to compare, and it's important to consider the differences between the two types of cultures. Um, how about in your, if you're in a classroom or a district, where do you see your students, your SLIFE students? Are they more individualist or collectivist? So you can share that in the chat. And this is just, this is an overview of some differences between individ, individualist and collectivist cultures. So where do you tend to see your students falling on which end of the continuum, more individualist or collectivist? You can share that in the chat. 
So I'm kind of assuming that you all know, you've talked about, you know, the concepts of individualist and collectivist cultures. Yeah, and I'm seeing collectivist from a couple of you, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> and Jen, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so what does that mean, right, for our SLIFE students? And, you know, we're sharing all of these resources with you on the Padlet. Please take, feel free to take these and share these with others when you're doing, you know, your own PLCs or turnaround training. So students who are from a more collectivist culture, we kind of assume they're probably going to do better in groups. And getting that conversation going is usually a top priority. Having them develop strong relationships with each other is very important. Um, and then, but we do, when we do require independent work, really being specific about what we expect in terms of individual responsibility, what students are supposed to create from their own. Yeah, and Darcy mentioned, my students come from collectivist cultures, but they quickly adapt to the group norm of individualist cultures. That's interesting. Yeah, I'd love to hear what strategies you have in place to help them adapt. So keeping all of that in mind, um, let's talk for a minute in the chat, or you can unmute as well, about in a res culturally responsive classroom or school, what would you expect to see? What are some things you'd expect to see? We're going to talk about a few of the senses here. What would you expect to see in a culturally responsive classroom or school? Some visual indicators, flexible groupings throughout the day. Thanks. Different languages, other languages. And I'll, that kind of dovetails with the next, what would you expect to hear? <laughs> and the final question, and probably the most important is, what would you expect to feel? Because that's what our students are gonna remember, is how you made them feel or how they felt in their school, safety. And I see that now echoed, yeah, April and Jen both shared that. Uh, they expect to feel represented. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, so keep those responses coming. Yes, yeah, seen and valued. Absolutely. Respective and valued. So just to give you thanks and engaged. Absolutely. An overview. So these five principles frame our book, Culturally Responsive Teaching for Multilingual Learners. And we're, I'm not going to go into great depth on each of these, but I'll just give you an overview and you can explore it some more on the Padlet. So we have our five guiding principles. The first is that it's assets based. And a few of you have mentioned that already today. When thinking about SLIFE, you know, we want to always look at their assets first and that it simultaneously supports and challenges students. We want to support them, but we also want to get them to the next level and give them just the right amount of challenge to get there. We want to be warm and informed demanders. It places students at the center of learning. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. It leverages their linguistic and cultural backgrounds, something that we've been discussing already. And finally, it, um, this is a thread that runs throughout all of the guiding principles. It really focuses on bringing together their schools, families, and communities. So we'll just look a little bit at each of these guiding principles. And then maybe we'll take a quick break after this to give you a little bit of stretch time and time for a, a coffee break. So in speaking of assets, I've one of the reasons we actually wrote this book is because we heard a lot of deficit language when working with teachers in different districts around the US and Canada as well. Sometimes this deficit language would kind of sneak in. Um, and that so we really thought it would be very important to be very intentional about always coming from a strengths-based perspective. And I myself always try to say, whenever I say the word need, I always try to balance it with strengths. So not just talking about needs, but strengths and needs, really kind of ingraining that into my own vocabulary. Um, recognizing what family engagement might look like 
for a family, it might be, you know, a family that's really struggled so hard to get here, right? So, so what if they don't show up to that parent-teacher conference? Maybe they're at home providing balanced meals for their kids and telling them about the importance of education, right? That's par parent or family engagement. So um, just having that, that different perspective is so important. The second guiding principle I mentioned, supporting and challenging students. We want to give them support to acquire language and access challenging content, not only providing them materials at their own level, but also letting them see what's expected, giving them a taste of what the grade level or content level expectations are, and giving them bridges to, to get there and building those cross curricular connections and giving them access to programs. Are they, are they in the running, right? Like, do we how can we think about SLIFE and gifted and talented? Are those two mutually exclusive? So something to, something to think about. So our third guiding principle is that students are at the center of learning. So they have voice and choice in their own learning. They can set their own goals. They're aware of where they are on the language learning continuum, for example. And so having them build this awareness and shaping and, and actively shaping the content activities, asking them for feedback. How did this lesson go? What would have worked better for you? Shannon and I were out in um, a school this, this week. It's all blending together earlier this week, doing focus groups with students, many of whom were SLIFE in a high school in Maryland. And it's just, it's very eye-opening to talk to the students themselves about what works for them and what doesn't work. Leveraging our students' linguistic and cultural backgrounds. This is kind of what most people think of when they think of culturally responsive teaching, but really getting a sense of what their backgrounds are and having many of you said you would feel valued in a classroom that's culturally responsive. So how do we get there? How do we ensure that they feel valued and understood? And the fifth is uniting their, our schools, families, and communities really having this welcoming environment being very intentional. Some of you mentioned, you know, making sure their languages are represented and having flags from different countries when they come into our districts. It's so important. And knowing what the barriers are to family engagement, but having some solutions to overcome them so that our families are empowered. And I think this is a good place to take maybe a five minute stretch break. And we'll come back at 4.06 with a video. So see you back at 4.06. Hmm. Welcome back, everyone. That five minutes went by pretty quickly. <laughs> OK, hopefully everyone is on their way back. So ooh, do we have the poll? ready as you come back in we'd like to ask you which guiding principle stands out to you in its relevance to life let's see let me see if i can oh i cannot launch it maybe diane or shannon should be launched Okay, maybe I just don't see it on my screen. Can you see it on your screen? Yeah, okay, great. And Darcy, thank you for your point that you brought up in the chat. So I cannot see the poll, but I'm hoping, can we stop it and share the results maybe? Thanks. I'm not able to see them. I'm not sure if that worked. <laughs> it did work? Okay. I can't see what you all said, so. Uh... 
it, it flashed up on my screen for a minute and then okay. it went away. I don't know if we can get it back. All right, well, we can, we'll think about, you know, what guiding principle did stand out? Maybe you can enter it in the chat, which guiding principle? One, two, three, four, or five. Two. Okay, two and three. I saw a four, a one. Yeah, and we'll think about how that guiding principle can support life. Um, so let's just be kind of thinking about the guiding principle. And we're going to just because we're behind a little bit, but we wanted to spend the time really chatting with you in that first breakout group. Um, yeah, and Darcy asked, clarify what assets based means. Absolutely. So assets based is always starting with students' strengths in mind first. Mm. And really, yeah. And just in contrast to deficit based, where people may assume that the student is kind of at fault or is mm -hmm. kind of a net loss instead of a net gain on our I on see. our system. Yeah. Thanks. Positive, positive, positive. thing. Absolutely. Right. Yep. And also, I want to point out that we we use assets with an S to show that it's plural. So our, that our students bring many assets. Um, so we always want to start off with that in mind. Thank you. So we're going to watch a quick video. And then as you watch, I'd like you to just note mentally and take a mental note or you can jot down which guiding principles do you see represented here? And this is um, authentic video from uh, Syracuse City School District in New York State of many uh, multilingual learners and some SLIFE as well. I'm gonna put a couple questions up on the board that I want you to discuss with the people in your group, okay? We started today just sort of with an introductory question, just sort of getting them talking in their groups um, and also hopefully connecting to their own personal experiences of um, forced movement for one reason or another. We did that and then uh, we watched a quick video um, just again to sort of front load some of the content. So mm -hmm. They would it have is, a little bit more yeah. exposure to it, followed by a short paragraph of, of notes, um, sort of filling in some of the key concepts and um, things that will often appear on a Regents exam. Have you ever moved and why? So I want you, as you're writing the objective, take a couple minutes to just talk in your groups about these questions. Ladies, if you're in a same language group and you want to talk in your language, that's fine, okay? Take a couple minutes to discuss this. So for Puerto Rico, here, and then I went to Florida, and I went back here. Move somewhere because okay. their country problems or how the their economy is. Uh, when they move from the world, they don't choose it. Right. They have to move to save their life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah. The reason people move, I already told them, because I guess it sometimes it's because they don't feel safe, okay. and then sometimes it's because they just want to move to take new experiences. Do any of you guys have family that have moved to the States in the last couple of years? Uh, yeah. Why? Because sometimes, like you said, it's not safe or they don't have enough space or just they want to start a new life. What else happened recently that would affect? Or they want to start a career. Okay. Like but one of the things that works particularly well with this group of students is that they've been together a lot. So they have a lot of relationships sort of already established. So there's a, a sense of comfort. Um, even to the point that at the beginning of the year, at one point I had students that were like, miss, why aren't all of my classes like this? Like, I feel safe. I feel like I can talk and express myself. Um, but again, I think that's a lot of why I sort of try and front load some of the content, whether through the video or through the notes um, or through conversation about their own experience. So that then when they're diving into um, a document, they have a little bit of context for what it's about. Um, I also had tablets at each of the stations where they could use Google Translate for those that have first language literacy. Um, so some of them are real quick to sort of seek that out on their own. Others sort of need to be prodded to do it a little bit more. Um, 
like my my Arabic girls um, that sort of travel in a group, um, they're very good about seeking that out for themselves, and they will often have their phones out to translate and things like that. Um, I also added uh, some additional images to each of the pages too, so they didn't all come with a map, but I figured adding the context of a map, um, like in one of the documents it made a lot of references to different states, um, and I knew that most of them weren't going to have an idea of exactly where Louisiana and Tennessee and all of these places were, and so um, mm -hmm. I put maps alongside of it just to sort of add some additional context for them as well. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, let's come back together for a second, okay? I heard a lot of good things. A couple of reasons that people move. Someone shout out a few. Okay, maybe war. Why else? Jobs. Jobs. Safety. Okay. All right. Um, do people always pick where they move or choose where they move to? No. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay. And did you guys get a chance to talk about have you moved? Okay. You had those conversations in your groups. We don't need to get into all of that today, okay? But we all have various reasons for why we've moved, all right? Today we're going to talk about... Hey, thanks. There's a bit more of that video clip, but I believe we linked to it also in the Padlet. So, what did you see in terms of the five guiding principles to support multilingual learners and SLIFE? You can share in the chat, like, what numbers did you see? You saw us placing students at the center of learning. Great. Yet building on their prior experiences. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Right. We didn't really see number five, right? The families too much. Oh, some Robin says maybe there was some five. Okay, great. Yeah, this was, um, I would have to look up the name of the class, but it was a history class um, for English learners, like a sheltered, kind of like a sheltered history. Oh, neat. Yeah. So we're going to skip just because we're running a little bit behind. You can take a look in these documents on your own. But um, we're going to touch on a little bit of social emotional learning and life. So just, um, I'm sure, if you can share in the chat how much you know, how comfortable you feel about SEL. Are you a one, a two, or a three? One is not too sure what it is, and three is, oh yeah, I could I could share about this just to see where you're all coming from and how much. Um, okay, we two and a three. Okay, so I'm sure you've heard the term by now, right? Social emotional learning, SEL. So this is Castle's definition. And Castle has a framework that was not created with multilingual learners in mind, where we have the five components um, that are in the middle in the orange and yellow and green parts of the circle and their competency. So uh, last spring, we started hearing, you know, just so much about social emotional learning. And so my colleague Mindy Teach and I decided to create a framework that adapts Castle um, and embeds considerations to support multilingual learners equity. And so we share that link in the Padlet and we look at, oh, thanks for sharing what CASEL is, April. Um, we look at CASEL's five competencies and then we share multilingual learner considerations to support equity and then some actionable, um, actionable actions, educator actions to support equity in each of these areas. So um, just in very kind of broad brush strokes, and we're, we're actually working on a book on this uh, topic right now. So in terms of the castle's competency of self-awareness, a consideration is that our students may be coming from a collectivist culture. In terms of so self-management, looking at our students' culture, um, there might be very different social norms around self, what castle refers to as self-management. In the third area of social awareness, our students are generally um, pretty well versed in uh, different perspectives, right? Because they have a perspective that is different than the, um, the dominant cultures. 
and relationship skills, they might have communication patterns that are a little bit more unique, including nonverbal communication, and they can be extra challenging. And in terms of responsible decision making, our SLIFE and multilingual learners might be bringing with them um, a sense of inequity and experiences with trauma and the stress of acculturation might really challenge their sense of agency. So um, we're, we're going to be thinking about SEL. You can share in the chat which competency do you think is the highest priority for SLIFE? And then I'm going to share some strategies to support social emotional learning for SLIFE. So what do you think is the highest priority? From what you've seen, you may be integrating or seeing SEL integrated into classrooms right now, but we can be thinking about what's the highest priority. So you can share in the chat relationship skills. Yeah, I'm seeing that. Absolutely. Thank you. And so I'd like to just briefly share a couple of strategies, well, actually three to support social emotional learning for SLIFE. And you see an asterisk asker after the end of each of these. So we wanna do all of these things within a culturally responsive context, right? So I just shared about uh, that a little bit as well. So our first strategy is to really help in terms of building relationships. So one strategy can be to do identity portraits with students. And these examples come from a middle school educator in Georgia, where students draw themselves and they draw a line down the middle. On one side, they draw their skin tone, their hair, shirt, jacket. And on the other side, they draw in their identity markers. So they can use words or images or color. And this helps draw attention to visible and invisible identities of students. Um, and this can be, this is a strategy really might resonate with SLIFE students, but also all learners to see their, their visible and invisible identities. Another example that I've, um, I've observed in a middle school in a very diverse school in Maryland is what they call data day and den day. So they teach all of their middle schoolers this um, self advocacy skills and self management. So they set and monitor goals and they reserve one period across the whole school each quarter where they take a look at how they're doing in terms of their grades and their classwork and their online portal. And they're able to then write down what assignments they're missing. And then on data day, they have time to go and meet with those teachers and to talk about what do they need to do, what assignments are missing, or maybe a plan to improve their attendance or their grades, and a way to, to follow up. So it's a really powerful way to focus on these self-advocacy skills. And then the third area, the third strategy is to integrate SEL with academic content and uh, thinking of curriculum as a mirror and a window. So this helps bring about social awareness and making sure we're um, utilizing both kinds of books, both mirror books and window books so that we're able to build empathy across and within cultures. So very quickly, those were a few strategies, but uh, I'd like you to be thinking about how you might think about sharing um, to integrate SEL in SLIFE. And with that, I'm going to, you can share this in the chat, be thinking about that. And then I'll give it back to Shannon to share some more tools and strategies with you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to share briefly some tools to go along with um, not only the guiding principles that Diane shared, but also um, overlay some of those uh, SEL pieces that she mentioned as well. Um, so we're going to take some independent exploration time. Um, but I wanted to, like I said, share a few of these tools that go with each of the five guiding principles. The first guiding principle, uh, the tool here, um, which is a document five within uh, the Google uh, 
the Google uh, folder has uh, looking at deficit perspective uh, to an assets-based perspective. This tool helps you think about, um, again, those perspectives around SLIFE and how to shift that perspective to an assets-based one. Um, it also provides that opportunity to think about how you can advocate for SLIFE in your own school communities. The next tool that you can explore is the SLIFE's Materials Selection and Adaptation Checklist. Uh, this scaffolding lesson plan checklist here is just another tool that can support you in developing scaffolded lessons for SLIFE and collaborating with colleagues to develop those scaffolded lessons, really looking at what the demands are and those considerations to keep in mind for our SLIFE uh, students. And it emphasizes again, looking at their strengths and what other supports that they might need uh, to meet that language and academic demand. The third tool is the goal setting tool uh, for language development. Uh, this is an example of supporting SLIFE as they set those goals for the year and then monitor them, very similar to that DEN day or data day that Diane shared in the SEL component. So it really puts them at the center of uh, their own learning and supports that SEL skill of self-management. Um, tool number four, assessing multicultural resources. Um, it looks at your resources a uh, to really review to make sure that they reflect your SLIFE uh, and making sure that they're seen within the curriculum. And the last tool that we have that we're sharing is the a uh, community walk student planning template that aligns with guiding principle five. It just is a wonderful example of how you can develop that relationship between school students, families in the community uh, and emphasizes the importance of developing that social awareness, self-awareness and relationship skills because this community walk is something your students plan to take you as the educator on. Uh, so it really helps them to advocate to show what are the important aspects of their community that they want you as the, the educator to know about. So um, thinking about the tool that you're most interested in based on uh, where you are, um, just briefly in the chat, just put in a one, two, three, four or five as to which tool you're thinking about exploring. And then we'll start, uh, we'll drop in some of those tools again and you can take some time to explore. It looks like a lot of you are looking at that deficit perspective, well, to an assets-based perspective. The multicultural resources is another good one. Great. So we're going to take about five minutes to do some independent exploration. I think Diane Choi already put in uh, the link to the Google Drive or the Google folder that has all of uh, those guiding principle uh, tools. They would be uh, they're all labeled one, two, three, four, and five. Um, take a look at just one of them and consider which you could use in your context, how you might adapt it uh, for your world. Um, and we're going to just feel free to turn off your screens while you explore that. Um, and we'll set the timer uh, for five minutes.
So we're going to head into breakout rooms. I'm, I'm sure we didn't give you plenty enough time. If you're like me, you wanted to explore all the tools, not just one of the tools. Uh, but uh, we are going to switch it and head into breakout um, rooms to share the tool that you explored um, and just discuss uh, how that would support SLIFE in your classroom or school or district um, and how you're planning on implementing it. Um, Really excited to hear uh, the tools that you talked about and just each group sharing out the tool that kind of rose to the top in their discussion. Um, let's see, I think I started with group one last time, so let's mix it up. How about we start with group three? I know I left there and you were still embroiled in a really good discussion. I'll speak because I was asking a lot of questions. Um, we were talking about the asset model and we were talking about um, how you can sort of meet the student where they're at, which is looking at all the skills that they do bring to the classroom and they, they do bring to whatever lesson you are trying to teach them and um, how their prior experiences um, impact and influence whatever that you're teaching them right now and how that while it might not be the traditional way, that can be a way that you can leverage that so they can, can access whatever lesson you are bringing them. That I think is to me what the asset model means. Um, I don't know how what the rest of my group would say, but that's what it means to me. Thank you, Laura. Um, how about group one? That was my group. We did talk about a couple of the different tools. I think uh, our uh, afternoon might be settling in a little bit here to <laughs> share out. Um, would anyone like to share or shall I just chat a little? Okay, I'm getting the yeah. go ahead. Yeah, we talked about a, a couple of, yeah, a couple of different tools. Um, we kind of talked about the first tool, the deficit perspective, um, and it was mentioned, I've heard some of these same statements. Um, and then we also did talk a little bit about the multicultural resources tool, number four, and then the community walk, kind of brainstorming for how could the community walk happen in a, maybe a more rural area, maybe taking a bus out into the communities, for example. And we shared how this um, activity is really student run and student focused. That kind of ties into group three, kind of when I first entered was starting, it was talking about adapting that uh, tool five on that community walk and what would that look like, especially when you have more than one language or more than one culture within a community. Um, and group two. And just unmute. We spoke about the selection and adaptation checklist and the community walk and changing deficit statements to asset assets based statements. And I think that um, the 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 discussion um, ended up primarily around the deficit versus the asset based perspective um, largely with an appreciation for um, what te teachers are taking on and trying to figure out the best way to um, address the needs of individual multi-language learners. Um, and so I think it, it really, our, our group, and, and anybody chime in from group two, but I felt like there was a genuine appreciation for the weight that that classroom teachers are carrying and that a system in place for supporting multi-language learners um, would be really ideal such that teachers could lean on that. Um, and some of these tools you know, might be a part of that system. Thank you. And I think that that ties perfectly back to Laura with, you know, I think the, the underpinning of that deficit mindset to a an assets-based one 
uh, is kind of where we all start uh, when shifting the balance and really meeting the needs of our students uh, in culturally responsive ways. So as Diane mentioned, I think we're all getting to that moment where we're waning in this afternoon. Um, so we're gonna talk about our next steps uh, this, this afternoon. And um, we're really hoping that you implement some of these strategies and tools in your class, your school, your district, and your programs. And uh, definitely attend one of our upcoming sessions uh, on effective instruction, supporting family and community engagement, and supporting graduation and post-secondary success. Um, the last thing that we're going to ask you to do today is to give us some um, feedback with a brief evaluation. Um, uh, and we just thank you for taking time out and really um, having some good discussions today uh, in the chat and in the breakout rooms. Uh, we really wanted to help define SLIFE and their characteristics, explore strategies and tools for creating a culturally responsive school climate um, that includes social emotional practices and apply those tools and strategies to your world. And again, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much. We hope to see you the next time. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, please take a minute to give us some feedback on today. We have a ending a little bit early, so if you could stick around and fill in uh, document 10, that would be great. Great. Thanks. Thank Bye. you.